Welcome to the MAPS Language of Sales, call number two. Kate and I are so excited about today's class, and there's a few things we want to really emphasize and then get out of the way at the beginning. Number one, the best way to communicate is the Facebook page. If you want a practice partner, an accountability partner, you want to share a sentence you've written with your homework so people can help and talk to you about it and share, use the Facebook page. Basecamp is for us to communicate with you. When you respond to something on Basecamp, 4,000 people get your message. Believe me, that's not the way you want to be communicated with. All right, so the next thing is, if, if you would yes. okay, whoever that is, if you would like to participate on today's call and you are in a quiet place and you can be 100% focused and actively participate and really play with us at a high level, please raise your hand so we can unmute you and then use the mute on your phone until you're ready to participate. I know a few of you are already unmuted. And if you're unmuted, same thing. Just use the mute on your phone for right now until we're ready for you to jump in. Hey, okay, so Roger. Just so we can call to their attention, if you guys look at, you'll have a hand, and that's how you raise your hand. There's one other thing that's really important. If you dialed into the webinar and you're using the speaker on your computer, you're not one of the best candidates for actively participating because you're going to get a lot of feedback. So if you're, um, yeah, if you really want to actively participate, uh, you could do that next week. Just we ask that you, this is both what Ron and I do. We turn down the volume all the way on our computer and we're dialing in from a landline. So that's just uh, so that we have a very clear recording. And then we just ask at this time, if you're not actively speaking, which is really just Ron and I right now, you use the mute button on your phone. To, so we're not getting a lot of background noise because we've got a lot of background noise right now. Okay, thanks. Great. Appreciate that. So here's the thing. Are you already starting to realize that the more focused you become on your effective use of language, the more you realize how much you have to learn? That's the exact reason that you're in the language of sales with us. Our commitment is to position you to have power in your communication style by actively engaging in this program. Whether you're participating verbally or you're doing the work in the workbook, stay in this game 100% and play full out. And when you get the recording, listen to it. That second time through, you will pick up many gems that you might not have done the first time. So here's what we're going to work on today. We're going to review your mastery work from last week and that we talked about keeping your ego in check. Hey, whoever that is, we need to meet that person. Hey, guys, if you're on the phone and you've got a lot of noise in your office, just put yourself on mute. Okay, right, well, good. we're you should good. be able to just mute. Yeah, yeah Nicole just it. sent me a thing. They couldn't identify it, so they're working on it on the back end. Okay. All right. Great. All right. So we're going to review our homework. We're going to then move into creating a state of being by owning and operating the prerequisites of NLP. We're going to be introducing tie downs and the language patterns and how we use them. We're going to discuss how they work and take it a little deeper than what you may have learned when you were in bold. And last, we'll talk about next week's and we're going to go back to calling it growth work, not homework. So let's talk about last week's work. As we begin to review the commitments you made last week in your work, it would be a great opportunity to mentally, and in your notes, check off where you hit the mark and recommit to any areas that you just didn't do what you know you're capable of. So remember, the game that we're playing is we all have integrity. Integrity is being our word and keeping our commitments. And when you got into this class, you signed, hopefully, and returned to MAPS your commitment agreement. 
If you didn't get that, don't mention it on Basecamp. Go to FastTrack at KW.com and say, hey, I didn't get my commitment agreement, and I want to do it because I have integrity and I want to commit. The question is, where have you posted your commitment agreement? After you signed it and filled it out, did you make copies? Did you time block for it? Did you create a space where you see it every day? Did you then put the mastery work that you're going to do into your schedule? Because if it's not in your schedule, it doesn't exist. Are you doing your sentence writing? I used to wake up at 4.30 just to get my sentence writing done before I started my normal day that started at 5 a.m. So are you going to participate? Are you going to interact? Are you doing the work? Last week we gave an assignment of writing Monday through Friday, five sentences a day. It should have been 25 embedded command sentences all together, and it was supposed to be in the context of closing for an appointment. Did you complete your growth work? And this is where we would love some group participation. Who would like to share how it went writing those sentences and maybe even share one of those sentences with us? And there's an icon to raise your hand, or if you type it in the uh, questions, we can also read them on our end. So any questions so who did on your homework? Commands? I did. Great. Who's this? Can you hear me? Because <laughs> I was, can hear, you. hear you. Okay. Um, you want one. The fact that you didn't sell your house in six months while others did is exactly why we should set an appointment now so that I can show you how my listings sell within 30 days. Perfect. Perfect. So the embedded command was set an appointment now. A nice use of a downswing. You, used, you could tell that you're skilled in language. You used a couple of language patterns in there, so nice job with that. Somebody wrote in, and they have um, a sentence that they wrote, and their sentence goes like this. Your home may be worth way more than you think. Now, that is a brilliant thought. And for sure, that's a thought I'd want to anchor to you, Ron, if you were in my house. And what we have to remember is an embedded command is a series of words that stand alone. So this is where why we take the time to go through some homework assignments so that you gain clarity. If we took and isolated the word way more, is that a command left or a suggestion that would le be left in the mind of the listener? You're asking me. Okay. No, not really. Right? No, it's not. It's not. And so the thought is a good thought. And when you take your sentence structure and you're looking at your sentence, isolate your embedded command. If you say, set an appointment now, is that a suggestion or a command to the mind of your listener? List your house now. Yes. Reduce your price. And so that's how you know, is this actually a command? A command is something that you're leaving in the mind of the listener. It's not something that you would be included in or an action that you would be taking more than it's a command that if I left that person, that would be left in their mind. Remember what we talked about last week. Right? We talked about last week, uh, you're speaking and your listener is hearing 450 words every minute. They're only processing 16, uh, I'm sorry, 17 to 25% of those words, which means that you cannot be assured of what they're actually internalizing when you analogically mark, and that's the pause, the embedded command being louder, the pause at the end and the downswing in your embedded command it guarantees they are left with the embedded command in their mind. So somebody else writes in, Mr. Wexler, when you meet with me, I can show you how we get home sold quickly. Somebody's buttering up to you, Ron. That's a great yeah. embedded command. That's a great embedded command because if we separate it, the embedded command is meet with me. So right. even if Ron didn't great. hear anything else, after Tom walked away, he would be left with, 
meet with me, meet with me, meet with me, meet with me, right? Okay, good. So somebody said, I see it's not like action. Right, put me to work, choose me, buy a home. Those are embedded commands. Now we asked run as well that they go out in the world and they utilize them 10 times intentionally every day. Anybody have feedback? Dan, who has a real life time that they use one that they'd like to share? Somebody wrote in one they used last week. At the end of the meeting, the worst thing that can happen is you list your home with me and get it sold in 30 days and have to move quickly, right? Great utilization of an embedded command. Right. Yeah, I love this one from Dagmar. It says, I hear you and appreciate what you're saying. Let's do the right thing and meet so I can show you when you hire me that I'm the best agent to sell your house. When this, right. when the three, listener walks away, days. what are they, what are they left with? Do the right thing, hire me, sell your house. Great Doesn't utilization, right? Great utilization. Awesome. So this is a, a phenomenal opportunity for those of you. Ron, can you repeat the name of the Facebook group so people can start um, posting sentences in the Facebook group, which is where you and I are going to evaluate sentences. Right. It's MAPS Language of Sales 4.17, I believe. Or MAPS Language of Sales. 4.17. 4.16. It says 4.16? Something like that. It looks close. April 17th. It's 4.17. So if you will go okay. and request to be participants in that Facebook group, we will get you on that group. I know we have half of our group that's on it right now. Um, somebody just wrote in a question. Again, your questions, because we're moving on from embedded commands. So if you've ever been through the language of sales, we're going to pick up speed each week. And we're going to move on to another language pattern that will build on the first language pattern. Can there be too many embedded commands in one statement? No. No, I don't believe there can be too many commands. Oh. Can I master the, the delivery of the embedded commands? Right. If the commands are delivered right, honestly, most of your conversation is going to be command after command after command. Right? It's the ability to deliver the embedded commands. Yeah. Any other last-minute questions before we move on to a new topic today? I'm just watching the question box. We are 4.17, somebody. Okay, good. Yeah. All right, perfect. I think everybody's questions are answered. So Great. today what we would ask you consider that language is just language, right? Until you're being, right? So being just means the way you show up in the world or your example to others through your attitude and your actions, right? Language is just language until your being is in alignment with the language. So there's this saying, right, the meaning of communication is the response you get. Now, I don't know about you. That's sometimes a hard pill to swallow. Because in real estate, how many of you have ever gotten an unfavorable response? Now, we'd like to say, well, the response is the issue of the seller or the issue of the buyer or the issue of the person on my team. And what if the response has everything to do with the way you utilize communication? If your words and your being are congruent, your effectiveness in communication will be severely impacted in a positive direction. And if they're not in alignment, severely affected in a negative direction. We mentioned this last week during the call. 7% of language is represented through the words we speak. So let's do a quick check-in, right? What part of communication is generated through tonality? If you know the answer, just use the question box. Does anybody remember? So 
is represented through, represented through tonality. And then 55% of communication is represented through body language. Now, knowing your commitment is effective in influential language, allowing you to significantly impact your listener. We think naturally you'll agree that spending time creating congruency between your words and your state of being is a worthwhile investment. So how do you do this, right? Well, a powerful way to create congruency in your communication and establish rapport with people around you is to choose to learn and understand some of the fundamental presuppositions of the language of sales. Now we're going to cover a portion of presuppositions this week, and then we ask you master them over the next week. So we're going to go to your notes. If you guys could turn to page three in your notes. The first presupposition we're going to talk to is this idea of respecting the other person's model of the world. So if you could fill in the word, respect the other person's model of the world. And as we go over today's, um, you know, today's content, this first portion is really more of a being activity, and the second section we're going to cover is a skill-based. So we're going to align being and language. So if you've been through BOLD or some of you have been in Mastering Your Mind, which is a MAPS group program, what you want to remember is that no two human beings have the same experience. Like it's impossible that two people on this call are having the exact same experience. It's estimated that there's 2 million bits of data that are presented to your brain every second. 2 million presented to Ron Wexler's brain, 2 million presented to my brain. So what happens is the human brain, and this is in your notes as well, it's the bullet point underneath, the human brain takes the data presented, and what it does is it begins to fill in the words distort and delete. So 2 million bits of data are coming in through a funnel system, the brain distorts that information, it deletes that information, and it generalizes that information down to 126 bits of data. Now in BOLD, your BOLD coach would have you do an exercise, and if you've never been through BOLD, this is a really good opportunity if you close your eyes for a minute. And with your eyes closed, imagine you have 2 million toothpicks that are falling from the ceiling every minute and they're falling right in front of your visual field. And now imagine you're reaching out every second, and every second you're grabbing a handful of those toothpicks. Now keep in mind, they're falling at a rate of two million every second right in front of you. And you're continually grabbing those toothpicks, 126 of those every second. Now can we make some agreements based on that? you're probably not even conscious why you chose the toothpicks you chose because they're falling so fast, right? The data's coming at you so quickly. Consider that what we do is we grab automatically based out of habit or what you've heard Diana say, based from our programming. Remember, programming is nothing more than a learned behavior from the past. It's highly unlikely that any two people grab the exact same toothpicks or grab the exact same data that's being presented. So if we have people that are actively engaged on the call today, what I'd ask that you think about is you think about for a minute, right? Have you ever presented a listing presentation to a husband and wife? Have you ever been baffled that they heard two different presentations? Or you're showing a home to a you know, husband and wife, buyer and seller, and you're surprised that they're seeing two different things or experiencing two different things. Well, based on what we just spoke about, I'm sure at this point it makes sense. No two people have the same experience, even when presented with the exact same data. The way someone, whether it's your spouse or your partner or your lead or your prospect, the way that they perceive the world around them is based on the data that they choose. The data they choose is what they process, 
and this creates their world. And from per their perspective, their world is their reality. Now, since this is the way we process information, is anything really one way? Absolutely not. So operating from when I go into an appointment, when I'm in my lead generation, when I'm working with my team, I'm going to respect the way the world is occurring for my listener. When I respect the way my world is for my listener, now my being will be in alignment with my language. Let's look at number two, right? So if you go to number two, which is going to be on page number five, second presupposition that we're going to talk about, a prerequisite of language of sales, resistance in a client, resistance in a client is a sign of a lack of rapport. Still in the world, lack of rapport. Now here's the reality. There really are no resistant clients. We only have inflexible communicators. Right? All accomplishments of the human race, whether they're positive or negative, have involved the use of language. So we use language in two ways. We use language to represent our experience, right? When we use language as our representational system, we are actually creating a model of our experience. And remember from the first prerequisite, every person will have a different model of the world based on the way to select data. The second thing we do is we use language to communicate our model of the world to one another. And we do that through primarily conversation. Some of us do it through writing as well. When you experience resistance in a client, so if we have anybody that's actively engaged right now, what is a symptom of a resistant client? Speak up or raise your hand. Or right in the box. What is what is something that you can tell that you're in, dealing with a client who has a lot of resistance? They stiffen up. Their body okay, language so gets really stiff. Perfect. They may stiffen up. They may cross their arms over the chest. What else? Yeah, someone wrote an objection. I say that again. So they're not really paying attention. They're they may not be distracted. paying attention. They're not really you know, engaged you with you. Yeah, you could have a wife engaged yeah. and you could have a husband staring off into space. Is that a resistant client? Yeah. Yes. Yeah? So you want to know, like, what is, what shows a resistant client? Lucy, did you have something you wanted to add? No, we have Lucy for a minute. Okay, so when you experience a resistant client, it's generated from a lack of respect for their model of the world. That resistance is just because there's no rapport that's present. So when you utilize listening and communication skills, it can ensure rapport with the client. So we've given you a couple bullet points to help you with this right away. Practice listening with the intent to fill in the word understand versus the intent to respond. Right? Practice listening with the intent to understand versus the intent to respond. Anybody have an idea of what that may sound like? Okay, let's do a little be honest. Ron, has there ever been a time in your early days of lead generation that you were more focused on the next question that you stopped listening to what somebody was saying? Of course. Right? There's yeah, times too. when... I, you know, I, I can think of a great example. You're, you're using the simple script, right? Uh, how long have you lived at this address? Where did you move from? Uh, if you were, where, where to move, where would you go next? And you'd say, how long have you lived at this address? And they would say, oh, we've lived here five years. We came from uh, New Mexico, and we'd probably move to Alabama if we ever moved again. And then you say, oh, if you ever moved, where would you go next? <laughs> Right? right? You're so focused on the next question, you totally didn't listen to their answer. And then what do they know? They know that you're not really engaged. Yeah. 
Yeah, and so the, the the thing I would the thing I would also have you and you guys can see, you know, like there's so many ways that we see resistance. This listening with the intent to understand. If I could give you a tip, the best place to practice at home with your spouse, your kids, the significant other mm -hmm. in your life, your friends, because what happens? They present something to you, and what they're saying starts to trigger you, and you're already formulating how you're going to respond without actually listening to what they're fully saying. And they already know how you're going to respond half the time because they can see that you're not really listening. And you're just formulating your response before they even get to say what they're thinking about. So one of the ways that we can do that is through asking clarifying questions. So clarifying questions are anything that expands on what your listener has said. So you could use clarifying questions like, help me understand. Could you expand on that? What does that mean exactly? Please say more. Even utilize something yep. like uh, a paraphrasing. So is what you're saying, and then you fill in the blank. Even if you think you know what your listener is going to say, ask clarifying questions. Remember, no two people have the exact model of the world, and failure to ask clarifying questions imposes your model of the world onto them. And what that does is that creates resistance. At a deep level, all of us as human beings, we, you know, we believe we're unique. And we want to be heard and seen as being unique. And the more you ask clarifying questions, the more you deliver, I want to know you. And that starts to build rapport. Let's look at number three. People are not their fill-in-the-world behaviors. People are not their behaviors. If you're going to be in the people business, it's critical to remember that people are not what they do. Sometimes your clients or your team members, they're going to behave in ways that trigger you. So you're going to hear Ron and I use this word trigger throughout our time together. Um, triggered. So think of trigger like a fish with a hook in its mouth. In that moment, the fish is at the mercy of the person holding the pole. Essentially, it's powerless. When we get triggered, we have emotional outbursts or emotional response. Then how many of you have noticed this? When you're triggered, you become, um, oh, I don't know, your communication difference, and maybe it's ineffective because of your state. So if you can just remember, what people do is what they do. What they do is not actually who they are. Ask yourself the following question. What might this client's behavior illustrate? How could I fulfill that need? If nothing else, it's going to get you living and showing up and being in a different space because all I'm thinking about is their behavior is an, in a way that's open to move this forward. What might they need from me in this moment? How could I fulfill that need? And then the last one we're going to do today is everyone's doing the best they can with their resources, so fill in the word resources, Everyone's doing the best they can with the resources they have available. And this is number four. So what do you think that might mean? If we took a minute, what do you think that might mean? means they're not trying to hurt you. They're just, you know, responding the way they, by their programming, I guess. Well, it could, right? So Kyle said that, right? He said, so those people are coming from habit, or they're coming from their model of the world, right? Or they're responding based on 
their programming. If you guys think about it, or, or somebody else said what they're accustomed to, how many of you would agree right now that you have more resources available to you as a parent than maybe what your parents had? Definitely. And if you have more resources available to you, do you do you give your child a different opportunity maybe than we had as opportunity? Absolutely. Now, if, the, yeah. if our parents That's had the less. well, if the parents had the resources, would they have utilized them? Of course. Yeah, uh, yeah they probably would have. Right? They probably right. would have. have I was going to say, if you have any age gap in your children, look at the way you behave with your younger children versus your older children. You, 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 part of the resources are your experiences. You had completely different experiences trying X on your older children. You learned it didn't work, and you didn't use it when you dealt with your younger children. That's a big part of it. What, what are the resources available? And it's the same thing. That's why the more you lead generate, the more people you talk to, when you do a bold 100, if you really stay focused and in those conversations, you're way better between num conversation number 80 and 100 than you were in number 1 through 20 because you've gotten responses from people and you've learned how to behave in between. So if we can remember that everybody I'm in front of is doing the best they can with what they have available. So crossing their arms may be the only thing that they know how to do because they maybe have never grown up learning how to use their voice or to, or to communicate a message that might not be in alignment with what you're saying. Now that you understand that everybody has this different model of the world, you also understand that all behavior is actually motivated from a very positive intent. What you and I may see as negative behavior is actually our opportunity to fulfill an unmet need in our listener. When behavior is out of line with a successful outcome and or relationship, utilizing listening with the intent to understand is always going to allow you to win, right? What is it that you've been attempting to communicate that I'm not hearing? Why wouldn't we ask people that? What do you need most from me at this time? How can I best support you? How can we partner through this and get you to the other side of it? We all on the same page? Yeah. All right, yeah. good. We're going to use the, and just so you guys know, I am looking in our question box as well as they're coming in. Um, I think it's, it, we have a lot of Kyles in this session, so um, if I ever refer to you as a he or a she or a, and you're something else, just correct me, and I'll get it. I'll get it under control really quickly. Uh, we're going to move into our now language. So we're going to be asking you to bring this up in your being over the next week, and then utilize the language Ron's going to cover with you today. All right. So someone asked just to repeat the two questions. So question one is, what is it that you've been attempting to communicate that I'm not hearing? And what do you need most from me at this time? And you could throw two, in some of the questions. A lot. Yeah. Oh, if, you, if, if everyone on this call would commit to using one of those two questions with someone when they get home tonight, your whole life could change on that one thing. <laughs> Yeah, if you, if you said, to, and I, you know, it's interesting, Ron and I spend time every week preparing for the call, um, and it's interesting, Ron, when you and I discuss this, I think there have been so many times in my personal relationship that I've said, what is it that you've been attempting to say, and I'm just not hearing. It is so that, that just, the fact that I even care right. brings the relationship It's, it's a great closer. offer. Yeah, it's right. just such a great offer, right? I'm offering to shut down all of my stuff and actually hear you. And you use that with clients, you use that with everyone around you, people on your team, people in your life, family members, use that one sentence. And like I said, it, it's a life-changing thing. It's really powerful. All right, so are we ready to move on to tie-downs? Yes. Here we go. All right. 
So the tie downs in, that you'll be on page uh, six in the uh, in the workbook. So what are tie downs? Tie downs are a linguistic pattern of the language of Sayer. A lot of you have been introduced to them already through uh, fold. They're just small phrases or brief sentences that you use after you say something that gives opportunities of interaction to your listener. So again, you're giving up, you just telling somebody something and you're asking them to engage in the conversation with you. And they're typically added on the end of a statement to gain agreement from your listener or a verbal way to take their pulse and see if they're really connecting. So let's just talk a little bit about how they actually work, right? In today's sales world, and if you think you're not living in a sales world, you're, you're dreaming because we're all selling something or someone selling something else all the time. A lot of consumers have learned how to remain poker-faced, right? They're showing little to no response to your pitch as a way to protect themselves from being pressured into making a decision or showing the direction that they are actually leaning. And the more technical driven our culture has become, the more talented people have uh, become at keeping on a poker face. They're just better at just not letting you know what they're really thinking. So every once in a while, you're going to be in front of a prospect that as you speak, they are either giving you verbal approval and they're saying things like, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, so true, or approval through their body language, right? They're nodding, they're smiling, uh, they're smiling and nodding. So if you're anything like me, you'll notice that when that happens, your confidence level goes up. As your confidence level goes up, you naturally feel comfortable and confident to ask for the signature. After all, it's highly unlikely that someone that's in agreement, whether visually or auditorily, throughout your presentation will dramatically shift away from the yes that their body or their language is giving you. So you're going to walk away with the appointment and with a signed contract more often. And a, a way that I test that that I think is really interesting is when you're in a class, sit up in the front of the class, make eye contact, contact with the pe person teaching and nod and agree as they're talking. And watch how they, I don't know if you guys have ever been at family reunion or something with me, and I'm sitting in the front row, and in the middle of what he's saying, Gary says, you know what I'm talking about, right, Ron? That's because I'm enthusiastically connecting with him while he's speaking. And you want to be doing that with them, and you want to see if they're doing it with you. So using tie-downs is going to allow you to take the temperature of the prospect know where they are in relation to the sales pitch that you're given, and it gives you the opportunity to adjust your presentation early on and along the way, and if necessary, to the model of your listener, which, again, helps you create higher conversion rates from your lead generation, from your lead follow-up, and from your in-person presentations. So when you artfully deliver tie-downs, they're really effective in the whole sales process and they help you gain more agreement. So as you advance in this class, uh, you're going to utilize tie-downs as, as a yes set, right? It's just a way to duplicate the response of the ideal client that every once in a while we get in front of, like we just mentioned. So they natural, naturally follow your lead, and you can actually create the response of your client when you decide to master your language of sales skills. So we'll go a little deeper on development of yes sets in a future uh, course. So let's just so why don't look we talk at about tie downs. yeah. Let's just look at tie downs before we practice some tie downs, right? Great. So tie downs technically are used with a downswing. So you guys will remember last week, embedded commands are used with a downswing, down right? So during practice, the easiest way we have learned to master the downswing is with a downward motion of your hand, similar to a karate chop. If you use a karate chop when you deliver it, especially in your practice, you will train your voice to go down. So what happens with downswings is downswings, and this is if you guys go to the bottom of page six and you're filling things in, see where it says keep the following in mind? Downswings create, fill in the word, confidence. Downswings create confidence in the mind of the listener. 
right, confidence in the mind of the listener, which more likely will lead to a yes. So if downswings create confidence, upswings create doubt. So fill in the word doubt. Upswings actually create doubt in the mind of your listener, which, more, which most likely is going to lead to a no or an objection. So we want to take time to master your downswing. And you will automatically begin to notice the effectiveness of your presentation is going to increase. So we've given you a series of downswings, and very similar to last week. We're going to ask that you go through and you start we're going to go through the list together, and we're, if it's two words, like it says, aren't they, aren't we, we're going to do aren't they, aren't we. Whether you're live with us or you're practicing, remember the importance we spoke about last week. When we're delivering new information to you, the information is coming into your short-term memory. Through practice, you're moving the information to long-term storage, and that's why it's so important that we practice on the calls that we have. Right? So we're going to look at the downswings on, or I'm sorry, tie down That's examples, right. right? So we're going to start with, isn't that what you want? Yes. Want is going to go down, right? And we're going to go right down. Don't you think? Aren't they? Aren't, Aren't they? we? Aren't we? Aren't we? Okay, guys, Don't remember the we. Don't you agree? <laughs> Okay, the we is the same thing we talked about last week. So I'm a fanatic about the utilization, proper utilization, because poor practice is going to equal poor performance. And so if, if we use the word aren't we, that E, what's going to tend to happen to your voice? E. 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 It's going to go up, right? It's going to go up. And so if we use aren't we and you push your voice instead of out to the side like clenching your jaw you push it down to the back of your throat your voice is going to go down so let's start it aren't they aren't we aren't they aren't, aren't they we? aren't we aren't, aren't, aren't we good we. don't you agree don't you agree don't, don't you agree, agree. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Wouldn't, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Wouldn't it? Couldn't we? Wouldn't it? Couldn't we? Couldn't it? Didn't you? Didn't it? Didn't you? Didn't it? Didn't you? Didn't it? Didn't you? Didn't it? Even if you're not live, be practicing. Close your door. Nobody cares. They're too consumed with themselves. Won't that be great? <laughs> that is the true story. <laughs> Won't that be great? <laughs> Won't that be great? Isn't that right? Won't that be great? Couldn't you? Isn't that, Couldn't that right? So I'm going to ask Can't that everybody's practicing this. It. So we've got shouldn't we, shouldn't it. I'm going to read through them quickly, and I know that you're practicing them. Shouldn't, shouldn't you, we, shouldn't they, shouldn't haven't, they you, haven't you, haven't they. Haven't they. Yep, keep up, and that's fair good. Enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Does that work for you? Isn't that true? Does that make sense? Makes sense. Don't you? Don't we? Don't you? Don't we? Okay. Right? Okay. Did you see how right. that works? Now, yeah. I will tell you a trick that I've had to use in my own life is getting rid of all the question marks. Because our habitual thinking is when there's a question mark, what's going to happen? You, do, you bring your voice up. up. Because right. if you don't bring your voice up, you're not dramatic enough in your presentation. So because we learn to tell stories and we tend to utilize our voice in order to illustrate the story, we tend to upswing quite often and we're doing the exact opposite in most of the language we're going to be utilizing in the language of sales. The only time we're going to upswing is when we want to create doubt in the mind of the listener. Gosh, you've never thought about selling it yourself, have you? You don't want to list with that agent, do you? <laughs> You're not wearing that, are you? <laughs> Did you guys get you've been the receiver of that, correct? Yes. And you 
immediately know, does it send a message to your mind like, oh, my God, I'm doing something wrong? Yes. And we're using them for, so the only time we're upswinging is if we're looking to intentionally create doubt. Other than that, we're going to downswing. So, Ron, you want to start putting these in sentences so we can yeah, so give them some examples? <clears throat> Absolutely. Let's put them in some sentences. So, in your notebook, uh, page seven. Let's move your appointment up by a week. You do want to protect your equity, right? Listen to what it would sound like with an upswing. You do want to protect your equity, right? What's more effective? You don't want to end up chasing the market, do you? You do want the most money possible, right? The strategies I've presented to you create the undeniable results my team gets. Can you see that? So when you're going down, what happens? After you sign the contract, I will immediately go back to my office and begin looking for the buyer of your home. Fair enough? Fair enough? Which one is going to have them in the game with you and engage? Once you reduce your price, we will open up the market to a new set of buyers, increasing the likelihood of an offer. That's the goal, correct? You see how that feels? Yeah, you know, Ron, somebody just um, typed in that it actually sounds, when you use the downswing, you sound like an authority. All right, well, do you say to your kid, go make your bed? We you say, go <laughs> make your bed. Does your wife say to you, you're going out with your friends? Or does she say, you're going out with your friends? It's, it's powerful. Everything we've done so far today, you know, if, just bring it into the conversations the rest of today. Right now, while it's fresh in your mind, when you're talking to people, be very cognizant of using these patterns and play with them. Have fun with them. That's what's going to anchor them for you. The thing we want to bring to your attention is there can be an overuse outside of an embedded command. Somebody asked earlier, can you overuse an embedded command? Can there be too many embedded commands in the sentence? There can be an overuse of tie downs. And so if you overuse a tie down, for example, a tie down like right, 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 and you do that consistently in your presentation, you can actually create some resistance with your listener because what it does is it almost occurs as if you're superior and they're inferior because they're not possibly keeping up with your train of communication. So just watch for overuse. And one of the best things that you can do is if you will record yourself. How many of you have ever recorded yourself during lead generation? You know, it takes some guts. And nobody oh, it's asked painful. Me, no. It's a little painful. First time you do it, it's painful. It is. Same thing as the first time you record a listing agreement or a listing presentation. Even if you get the listing, you'll go back and listen to it and go, oh, my goodness, I sounded like that. Well, what's going to happen <laughs> so, is, if you record yourself, you're going to start to notice your own use of tie downs, mm -hmm. and you probably have a favorite one. Um, I have a few of my favorites that I use quite often, and we'd encourage you this week to pull the list out. And by any means, this is not the entire list. There are certainly far more tie downs than what we've given, and start to utilize other tie downs than what you naturally would utilize. So we're using them to keep the client engaged. We're using them to get a pulse of our listener. And a tie down gives us permission to go to the next part of our presentation. So before we open it up for questions, here's what we're going to have you do this week in your work. Write five sentences that you can utilize in your career each day, adding a tie down to the end of the statement. So you have a total of 25 sentences for the week. 
share the sentences on our Facebook page, share the sentences with your accountability partner. Ron and I are accountability partners, so we'd be sharing our sentences with each other every day. That's the purpose of the accountability partner. Be purposeful about using your sentences throughout the week. And then we're going to ask that you write five embedded command sentences with a tie-down utilization on each. So now we're going to bring two language structures into one sentence. So they're going to be written for a total of 25 for the week. So if you add 25 and 25, what number do we end up with? 50. 50. 50. Now, this is going to mean you're going to want to have this time in your schedule. Remember, we spoke about this early on, and if you joined, you know, if you joined the webinar we did, you will pay a price while you're in the language of sales. You're going to have an investment of time. And we're not going to sugarcoat that and act as if it doesn't exist. There's going to be an investment of time, and that's a price you pay. And there's a price you're going to pay when your language skills stay exactly where they are today. And that price could be a missed listing opportunity, a missed buyer opportunity, a missed recruiting appointment. It could be three appointments or four appointments. We need to take a hard look in our profession that we're always paying a price. If you're looking at your conversion rate, who wouldn't you prefer to talk to 25 people and set five appointments than have to talk to 100 people to set five appointments? Yes. It's all about your language. Yeah, it's a big yes, right? You betcha. Okay. And, and somebody said, is there, you know, is there a site that I can go and listen to tie downs or learn more about? I'm having a difficult time um, hearing the difference. So even if you look at, you know, let's move your appointment up by a week. You do want to protect your equity. Now, is that something we want to create doubt in their mind or we want them to be certain of that? Certainty. We want them to have certainty, right? So would we use a downswing or an upswing? Down. You use a downswing, right? So let's move your appointment up by a week. You do want to protect your equity, right? Now, what about this? You don't want to end up chasing the market. Do we want to create certainty or doubt? Certainty. Right, so you don't want to create, end up chasing the market, do you? You know, if we have a for sale by owner, and a lot of you have called for sale by owners, or you're pre-qualifying your appointment, and we say to them, now you've never thought about selling it yourself, have you? Because doesn't it make it sound like selling it yourself is the most stupid idea you've ever heard? <laughs> Do you guys hear the difference between an upswing and a downswing? You just use the, okay, yep, I do. Okay, good. All right, good. So there's some clarity. Practice them with downswings. If you're looking to create doubt in their mind, use an upswing. The best way to know is to practice, and then what we're going to invite you to do is at the end of the call today, if you'd like to actively engage in next week's call, you're going to stay on the line for a couple of minutes, and we're going to tell you how to go about actively engaging in the call, because we do take a handful of people to actively engage in the call. So we're going to open it up to questions from today, and then we're going to wrap up today's call. Remember, your homework is always on the back part, or your mastery growth work is always on the back page of your notes from this session. Okay? You can right, you can never say your dog ain't your homework. Yeah, unless so you know. the whole thing. Right. So one one of the questions that I thought was really good right here um, online, Kate, mm -hmm. was um, is is there somewhere I can go to to listen to more? A, yeah. And I I I would say if you I would say when you get the tape of this call, if you listen to Kate and myself all the way through, and you'll hear sometimes where I don't 
necessarily do a downswing where it might make more sense. You'll hear times when we're both doing a lot of downswings. You'll hear embedded commands. You'll hear tie downs. All through this conversation, we're using what we're sharing. So I think go, going back, and I know I listen to recording twice a week. The first, I, I did this class for 18 months. I would listen to recording twice in between the actual calls. And just, just to really embed it because you miss so much. And then the other question I love here, it says, when speak, so Kate, you can answer this. When speaking on the phone, how much does body language impact what we are saying? Yeah. Hey, Lisa, great question. Um, I love seeing so many of you on the call. It's so exciting to know you're on the other side. Uh, so what we would focus on right now instead of even thinking so much about body language is focus on two things. Focus on the words that you're using because when you know the words you're going to use, you can give all of your attention to the tonality in which you deliver the words. So we will be working on rapport building skills over the next couple of classes. And as we do that, Lise, what we're going to be doing is working on our ability to mirror and our ability to match. So yes, body language does have an impact over the phone. And we'd like just right now to work on really just two things, which is tone and words. And here's the other thing that happens. Do you guys remember when Ron said, um, you know, he'll nod his head and then Gary will say, that's right, isn't it, Ron? Because he sees Ron nodding his head. What you guys will notice, and we don't talk about it a lot in this class yet, I'm just going to throw it out there because it's come up on this call today. In the front of your brain houses what we call mirror neurons. And your listener also has mirror neurons. And this is why sometimes you'll go to a movie and somebody's crying on the screen and you'll find yourself tearing up and starting to cry or a baby smiling and then you're smiling them at them really goofy because they're smiling really goofy and you don't even know why you're doing it. Their mirror neurons are communicating to you and then your body responds to those mirror neurons. When you're in front of a listener and you nod your head, you will naturally notice they will start to nod their head. And they will do it most likely without thought behind the fact that they're doing it. I used to be a bold coach for a long time and I would do it a lot, like in a room is nod my head and the people would start nodding their head. And they didn't even realize they were nodding their head till I brought it to their awareness. And that's because what you're utilizing in their mirror neuron. Well, the way mirror neurons can communicate things like somebody crying or somebody smiling and you're feeling like you need to smile or nodding their head and you find yourself nodding your head, the same thing happens when you operate from the four prerequisites we spoke about today. Because if I enter a conversation and in that conversation I have respect for another person's model of the world, I'm remembering that any resistance is just a lack of rapport and I'm seeing people for more than their behaviors, and I'm remembering that everybody can, is doing the best they can with the resources, could we make an agreement, my mindset shifts? And when my mindset shifts, my mirror neurons communicate a message of acceptance. And if there's a message of acceptance to the people that I'm in front of, their mind then will begin to accept me as well. So there's a lot of neuroscience work going behind what we're doing in the language of sales. I'm trusting that didn't muddy waters and instead it created some clarity of why would I want to do what we're speaking about on this call. All right, so some of us take it from with blind faith and just do what we're told and some of us have to know the science behind it. You're going to get the pieces either way. The bottom line is, are you going to do the work, implement what we're sharing, and have it make a huge difference in your success and in your life? Or are you going to get hung up in worrying about all the details and stay stuck there? So sometimes we're going to talk about things that are they just feel – like sometimes when I'm talking to Kate, it just goes so deep or so far, and I just want to cut to the chase. And so sometimes you're going to flake out, 
if you find yourself flaking out, flake back in. Don't yeah. don't bomb out. And if you're if like on today's call, we lost you a few times. That's why you want to go back and listen to the recording. Play well, the game. If, if you, you knew this, me. <laughs> Ron, if you had a reason that you were here, and you said I'm increasing my conversion ratio from 80% to 90%, I'm listing two mm. more properties that I wouldn't have otherwise listed as a result of being in the program, and you knew what the goal was of being in the program, trust me, it would cause more engagement because you have something on right. the other side. Now, here's the, and there's a lot of questions that are coming in. Somebody has said, do we have a CD? Go back to your bold CDs. If you go back to your bold CDs, you're going to hear this language in your bold CDs. And I think almost everybody owns a bold CD or you can borrow it from somebody else. Um, accountability partners. If you choose to practice on the phone, I would, I would practice and say, let's spend five minutes. You read your sentences and I'll read my sentences and listen for the delivery of the sentence. Right? And then um, what we're going to extend an invitation for you to do is if you'd like to be an active part of next week's call, we're going to ask you to stay for three minutes and we're going to tell you what that's going to entail next week. And then for everybody else, we will see you next week at session three of the Language of Sales and on our Facebook page. Thanks, everyone. So we're going to let a couple of lines drop and as they drop, Guys, if you're hanging out waiting for, okay, what happens next week, I usually wait until 2 after and then I'll start.